Baldur's Gate 3 can be a little intimidating for new players, but this video should remove any fear and any trepidation you might have while trying to enjoy your playthrough. This video is going to be the most complete beginner guide that I could make for Baldur's Gate 3 without spoiling anything. By the time you finish this video, you will understand every system that you need to know to play the game confidently. If you've got questions, ask them in the comments below. I'll read and respond to every single one. Also, be sure to take advantage of the timestamps to revisit any topic that you need to come back to later. Now, let's dive in. For PC players, you're going to arrive at a choice very early on. You're going to have to choose between DirectX 11 and Vulkan. Now, the developers had initially said that Vulkan was going to be the default option. However, it looks like they've removed the verbiage for this being default. It's no longer saying that. And it's got DirectX 11 on the left here. Vulkan was supposed to be more performant while DirectX was supposed to be more reliable, less crashing and that sort of thing. I ran it on DirectX 11 because I didn't want my game crashing and I didn't want to deal with any of that. And I have a pretty strong PC, so performance wasn't going to be an issue and it has not been. So this choice is a little bit muddy. Basically try one and if you're having problems, try the other one. After that, you're going to boot up the game. Upon booting up the game, you're going to see this menu screen right here. You're going to choose new game. You can also dive into the options menu early on if you'd like to get that out of the way, but we'll go over that more in a moment when we get into the game. First, we're going to choose new game. Now, from here, you're going to have three different difficulty options. Explorer being the story mode. It's going to be very easy. It really doesn't matter what combination of characters you use, what their stats are. This is going to be very forgiving. It's mostly for you to go through the story and enjoy the dialogue options and the results of those dialogue options. Then there's going to be balanced, which is a bit of both. It's got the story, but it's also got a bit of the difficulty tucked into it. If you make really bad choices when building your character, you're going to suffer the penalties for that. You're going to lose fights that you could have very easily won had you maybe made some better decisions. And then there's tactician. Tactician is the hard mode. This is the most difficult option and it's very much not recommended for new players. You are going to have to min max absolutely everything to come out of these battles victorious. So if you're a new player or uh, just a normal player and you're playing the game for your first time, I highly recommend going with balanced. And once you get into the game, if you find it too easy or too difficult, you can always change the difficulty at any time from within the game. So you're not locked into this choice forever, so don't stress it. We're going to hit start game, and then it's going to go through a cutscene. I'll skip the cutscene because you guys are going to watch that on your own. OK, now that we're here at the character creation screen, you're going to have a couple of options. You can either choose to create an origin character, which is going to come with its own story. This character has lived in the world. It has a history in the world. It has a presence in the world that's already determined. It has enemies. It has friends. It's already kind of a pre-written story, whereas your custom character, you are defining your own story. You define your relationships by how you behave and how you interact with people. You're a blank slate. The upside to choosing one of these is that you don't have to worry about all of the choices we're going to talk about right now because they can be a little bit overwhelming if you're a first time player. So if all of this sounds too complex and too overwhelming, then you don't have to stress it. You can just choose one of these and play as one of these. However, the developers recommend creating your own character, creating that blank slate and then engaging with these other characters the way they kind of intended. These are characters that you're going to encounter throughout the story. You're going to run into them. You're going to get to know them and you're going to unravel the mysteries behind their histories. All of this happens because you're playing your custom character that is meeting these people for the first time and kind of learning about them and what drives them, what motivates them and, you know, determining whether you're going to romance Shadowheart or Lazelle or Gale. You might have a relationship with these people or you might choose to make them your enemies or you might choose to leave them on the side of the road and not bring them with you. It's really up to you what you do with these characters. Now, one last thing to mention before we move on is the Dark Urge, which is a little different from the rest of the origin characters. These origin characters are predefined, predetermined. They have a history. They have an appearance. They have a class. They're all tied to them, and you can't really change them here in the character creation screen if you choose one of them. However, the Dark Urge is a little different. This can be customized. You can change the appearance and the class and all that good stuff. So it makes it pretty unique. The Dark Urge is going to be the closest thing to a horror playthrough that you can play through. It is named the Dark Urge because it has exactly that. It's going to have very dark urges. Very dark thoughts are going to creep into its mind and it's going to want to act upon those. So just be kind of aware of what you're getting yourself into. If you do decide to go this route, it's going to be a very unique playthrough. At this moment, you're going to have the option to edit your appearance. Now, I would say hold off on this for one moment, however. Don't bother editing your appearance yet because there's a few choices that you're going to make down the line. They're going to greatly change how they look anyway. And you might decide, oh, I, you know, I don't want that. So hold off on editing the appearance. 
you can choose the body type here. You can choose between female and male and bigger female and bigger male. There's some choices here you can make, so feel free to make one of those choices whenever you'd like to. And all of these stats here on the right, these are all gonna change based on the choices you make here on the left. These are basically the sum of all of these choices. There's no one thing you do here that's gonna make it look like this. We're Dex because right now it has chosen a rogue as the default for this character creator. And if we choose some other class, it's going to change the, the stat that is our primary stat. So it's got a star over this ability. It calls your attributes abilities. Each one of these is your ability is strength, dex, con, int, wiz, charisma. So the star over the dex means that this is the primary attribute or the primary ability for this character. This is based on the class you choose. So the defaulted to rogue. So it has the star over the dex, which means you'd like your dex to be as high as possible. Things are going to scale really well off of dex for your rogue. A lot of your dice rolls are going to benefit from having high dex. Same with your cantrips, your actions, your proficiencies. All of this stuff is going to change based on the choices we make here. So let's talk about these choices. The first one that you can make is your race. Now you can choose between 11 different races here. There's advantages and disadvantages to each one. And you can see what those are by looking right here, your racial features. You can move nine meters per turn as an elf. You have a proficiency with long swords, short swords, short bows, and long bows. It's gonna tell you, you know, maybe what weapons you're good with and what weapons you're not good with. And you can see in the dark really well, or you have an advantage on saving throws against being charmed and magic can't put you to sleep. And so if you hover over something and you're not sure what it means, you're gonna see the option that says T to inspect. Now, when you press T, it basically frees your mouse from having to hover over that. And now you can hover over the words that are yellow here. So you can see what they mean. If ever you don't know what something means, this game has a nice system that will really help you learn it by just simply hovering over the word that's in question. So advantage makes you more likely to succeed. Roll two dice and use the higher value. So whenever you have an advantage, the game is going to roll two dice. So let's say you're rolling a D20 and the person has a score of 15. So you roll two dice, one rolls a 14, one rolls a 16 the game is going to ignore the 14 that you rolled it's going to take your 16 it's taking the better of the two because you have an advantage and your 16 is going to land that hit so having an advantage is a very very powerful tool in this game and there's multiple ways to get an advantage and we'll talk about those in this video now saving throws determine whether a target resists a spell or a corruption so sometimes your character will have a basically a chance to resist something you'll have a saving throw and that's basically there's something bad that's about to happen to your character and your character has the opportunity to roll the dice and try to prevent that from happening to them it doesn't just happen to them they don't just take it they have a chance to basically defend themselves against it so that's the inspect tool you'll see it we'll use that a lot as we're going through this guide because it is incredibly useful and i really want you guys to take advantage of that so the main reason why you didn't want to choose your character's appearance just yet is because after choosing your race the next thing you're going to do likely is choose a sub race and the sub race can very much modify how your character looks so you can see if we choose this here and if we go to the Zariel each one of these has a very different look they very much modify how your characters look so if you had spent a bunch of time kind of editing their appearance before this it's you're going to click this button and then you're like oh wait no I don't like that that's not what I wanted so once you've made this decision now no go ahead feel free to come in here now here's where we've got our incredibly robust character creator screen uh, on the right here you can see it says general and this is where you can check their identity um, you can do voice you can choose a face lots of different faces to choose from you can choose their skin color and you can check this box to get even more options if you'd like to so it's really up to you what they look like you can choose scarring you know maybe you want something quite gruesome maybe you want something you know a little edgy and maybe you just want a face without scars no problem with that you can choose the maturity this is going to change how old they look you can give them freckles make the freckle intense or not and you can choose the genitalia that they have and once you've created your character you know you can choose to hide their clothes and see what they look like make sure you like everything no matter what attire they're going to be wearing in the game. And then you can go down to body art. You can choose tattoos, all kinds of things. Having some, having none, you can choose a bunch of different eye decisions, like eye color. Here she has uh, this. We can go with this. We can go with this, right? Lots of eye colors. Makeup, you can choose that. Hair, 
lots of really impressive hairstyles in this game lots to choose from facial hair same thing give her, give her a beard him a beard whatever you want to do horns you can all you can alter the horns hair color lots of choices here go ahead spend as much time in here as you want i'm going to kind of skim through it and let you guys do that on your own there's not much to explain there all right the next choice that you're going to have to make is going to be your class you can choose between 12 different classes you've got the barbarian the bard the cleric the druid the fighter the monk the paladin the ranger the rogue the sorcerer the warlock and the wizard now, each of these classes comes with their own utility, their own abilities, their own armor sets and weapons that they like to use. By the way, I just want to take a quick second to shout out Corsair. I've been using their new six button Dark Star mouse while I play Baldur's Gate 3, and it's been amazing. It's super handy being able to bind a few more things to the mouse without having so many buttons that it gets overwhelming. It really makes for some relaxing gaming sessions because it frees up my left hand for drinks and snacks. I do have an affiliate link in the description down below if you'd like to check it out yourself. Anyways, let's get back to the video. You can see the weapons and the armors that they like here. You can see their proficiencies. So the wizard is proficient with daggers, quarterstaffs, light crossbows, whereas the barbarian is proficient with simple weapons and martial weapons and light armor and medium armor and shields. Simple weapons are basically, they're simple weapons. They're clubs, they're maces, they're things that probably anybody could pick up and use where a martial weapon is something that requires more of an expertise to wield like a sword or an axe or a pole arm and that's kind of the differentiator here if you have a proficiency in a weapon that proficiency bonus is going to be added to your roll so if you roll a 10 then you'll get your proficiency bonus let's say you get a proficiency bonus of two and so your roll is going to count as a 10 plus two so you got a 12. So it just kind of adds on to your attack rolls. Proficiencies for armor make it so that when you attack, you don't experience a disadvantage on your rolls. So uh, there's advantages and there's disadvantages. When you have advantage, it's going to roll two dice and whichever dice rolled higher, it's going to use that for you. So if you need to beat a 15, one dice roll a 14, one roll to 16, the game will pick the 16 for you when you're at an advantage. When you're at a disadvantage, because let's say you are proficient in light and medium armor, but you're wearing heavy armor instead, then the game's going to put your attack at a disadvantage state, which means that you're going to roll the two dice and the game's going to pick the lower of the two and use that. So if you rolled a 14 and a 16 and you needed to beat a 15, the game will take the 14 and you'll miss the attack. So pay attention to the weapons that you're proficient with because that's going to greatly enhance your chance of succeeding with those attacks and pay attention to the armor that you're proficient with because this is also going to affect the success of your attack rolls. You want to be wearing things that you're proficient with in this game. Now, the way you see your proficiencies is you click the details button right here. This shows you the proficiencies for each class. You click that and then you can click on them all and you can see what each class is going to be proficient with. And you can also just look at them and kind of get a feel for what they are and what they are going to be about. This character is wearing leather armor. They're wearing a bow, right? That's the ranger. And they run simple weapons, martial weapons, light armor, medium armor, shields. You kind of get a feel for their vibe. You can also look at their description. Rangers are unrivaled scouts and trackers honing a deep connection with nature in order to hunt their favorite prey. So you've got cantrips. You can use these unlimited. You get to one battle, you use your cantrip. You get to the next battle, you use it again. You can use these cantrips multiple times in the same battle, in fact. Whereas spells, you have a limited number of spell slots, which means you can use these spells a limited number of times before having to set up camp and rest your characters so spells have a finite number of uses between rests whereas cantrips are unlimited that's the main difference between the two that you need to be aware of so having a really solid cantrip can be incredibly useful but so can having really solid spells of course uh, the class features down here level one spell slots unlocked you gain two level one spell slots which are restored on a long rest there's two types of rests in this game. There's a short rest and a long rest. I'll dive into the details on that more later, but just know for now that long rests will reset your spells so that you can use them all again. But I'm going to devote a whole section of this video to resting, when you should do it, how you should do it, and the benefits of doing it. There will be a timestamp down below for that as well. After choosing your class, don't forget to kind of come down here to the cantrip section and choose any cantrips that you might want to choose. Or if you're a bard, you're going to get to choose cantrips. You're also going to be able to choose 
introduce spells and a starting instrument. So don't forget to follow up your class choice with some incidental choices that are going to have to be made as a result of that class being chosen. After choosing your class and the incidental choices attached to the class, you're going to choose your background. Your background is going to add some skills to your character. If you are a charlatan, you're going to have deception, which means you're good at lying and cheating and manipulating the truth. You're also going to have sleight of hand which means you're going to wield nimble fingers and you can steal stuff better. If you had a criminal background, you would be good at deception, but you'd also be good at stealth. So staying out of sight, melting into the shadows, you have better chance to roll positively on hiding from people. If you're hiding and someone walks into the room, you have a better chance of them not noticing you when it comes time for the dice to roll. As always, there's no right or wrong decision for these things. It kind of just depends on how you want your character to be. Do you want your character to pickpocket and to sneak into places and to stealth? Stealth is incredibly helpful in this game. It allows you to surprise your enemies. It allows you to sneak up on them. It allows you to get a surprise attack on them. All of these things are really powerful. So it's it's really good to have at least one party member that's you know excels in their stealth capabilities and we'll talk about party composition here coming up in a moment but basically just know that you know you can build your character one way the way that you want to play and then you can have your party members your four different party members that you're going to have out with you to kind of handle the weaknesses in your build or the deficiencies or the things you know you're going to want but you just don't want to deal with on your character specifically so build your character the way you want choose the background that you want it's going to come with its own set of passives down here. These are the most important things to take note of when choosing your background. It's these skills at the bottom here. All right, next up, let's do a quick overview of the classes the game has to offer. Every class is good. It's just a matter of what play style you're looking for. First up, the Barbarian. This class has a weapon focused play style. They're great for multi-classing because Barbarians give you access to a ton of different weapon types like simple weapons, martial weapons, long swords, short swords, long bows, and short bows. They don't wear heavy armor, but don't let let that fool you a barbarian can be insanely difficult to kill if you want to be a durable damage dealer this is a great choice next up we have the bard your goofy charismatic jack of all trades thanks to the fact that they specialize in charisma as their main stat they're going to be absolutely amazing at dialogue sections in the game you'll be able to talk your way through just about anything a little bit easier than other classes when creating the class you get to choose between a hand drum a flute a lute a lyre and a violin as your primary instrument of choice so if you'd like a class that can do just about everything and play an instrument, the bard's for you. The cleric is an amazing asset in any party. It can use a wide variety of weapons, it can buff yourself and your allies, it's super versatile, and has some of the best healing in the game. Can't get close enough to a downed member to help them up? No sweat. One of the best parts of the cleric is its ability to pick up downed party members from up to 18 meters away. If you want to heal and keep everyone alive, the cleric is a fantastic choice and a great addition to any group. Next up we have the druid. The druid is your nature spellcaster. It's got access to a nice variety of weapons and oh yeah, it can talk to animals. No, I'm not joking. You can start up conversations with animals. You can also shapeshift into a variety of animals. Or if you'd rather, you can go a more spellcaster route and throw nature spells all day long. This class works great as both an off healer and a main healer. Really, you can't go wrong with having a druid or a cleric in your group. Next up, we have the fighter. The fighter is great at everything combat related. Melee, range, doesn't matter. They also get a self heal that gives them great staying power. On top of that, they start off with heavy armor proficiency, making them even more tanky. Great damage, great survivability, great combination. My favorite way to play the fighter is beating down my enemies with massive two-handed greatswords. If you're new to D&D and you want a simple, fun, and powerful class, fighter is a fantastic choice. You won't be buffing anyone, but you will be doing immense damage. Next up, we have the Monk. The Monk excels at unarmed combat and receives bonuses for not wearing armor and attacks with their fists. You can make the Monk more ninja-y by specking into Shadow Monk. You can also use Shadow Step to teleport from shadow to shadow on the battlefield, giving them great mobility. Monks also get a bonus action for unarmed strike, giving them access to big damage in a single turn, straight from the beginning of the game. If you want to punch things to death, Monk may be the class for you. The Paladin is your holy warrior. They just want to uphold their oath and bring justice to others. They are an amazing tank and have some solid healing. You can spec Vengeance Paladin and focus on putting out some massive damage if you want. They are a great ally to have around when fighting the undead. And if you're just looking for an incredible tank that won't die, this is a fantastic choice. Next up, we have the Ranger. You want to be Legolas? This is for you. The Ranger can have a familiar, and depending on the familiar you choose, you'll get different buffs. You can have a spider familiar and use its webs to slow and stop your enemies. You can also have a boar, a bear, a raven, and a wolf. Rangers have some really powerful kiss curse options that you can take to let them hit really hard, but at the cost of things like accuracy. If you're looking for a bow class, this is my favorite one. 
Ah, yes, the Rogue. The Rogue is perhaps the highest single target damage dealer in the game. They get access to sneak attacks that do phenomenal damage at the start of the fight, oftentimes leaving the enemy dead before they even know what happened. Rogues will hide before combat to sneak up to their enemies or snipe them with a bow while hidden for massive damage. Rogues are great at stealing if you're looking to steal everything in town to get a bit of extra coin. Rogues are also great at disarming traps, of which there are a ton in BG3. Rogues just bring a ton of utility, and I highly recommend having at least one in your group, either yourself or one of your companions. If you want a stealthy, murdery, steely character, Rogue is for you. The Sorcerer. The Sorcerer is a spellcaster who specializes in charisma. They have access to a lot of cantrips and so have fewer spell slots than the Wizard, which means you can expect to use a lot of cantrips on your Sorcerer. These mages can do a little bit of everything except heal. Don't expect the Sorcerer to heal. Being that they are charisma based, they do well in dialogue. If you want a mage type class, but you don't want to have to rely on setting up camp quite as often as some of the other mages, a Sorcerer can be a lot of fun. Next up, we have the War. Warlock. The Warlock also scales off Charisma, so it shares those benefits. It also starts with a cantrip called Eldritch Blast that you can spec into and use for the entire game. It's a starting cantrip that just scales really well. Again, this is great because it means you don't have to rest quite as often. Now, if you want to do a hybrid melee spellcaster, Warlock is probably the best option. Warlocks do have spells, but fewer than Sorcerer and far fewer than the Wizard. And finally, the Wizard. The Wizard is your true spellcaster. They can learn more spells than any other class. This is due to the fact that Wizards are able to learn spells from books and scrolls that they find or buy throughout the game. This is a stand back and do big damage type of class. They've got some fantastic AoE spells if you're looking for area damage to take down big groups of enemies faster. If you want to do big damage, you might try specking into Evocation. If you want to be a Summoner, you might try specking into Conjuration. And if you want to raise the dead, maybe spec Summoner. The Wizard has eight different subclasses all on its own. Due to its use of spells, this is another class that you'd long rest fairly often with to replenish those spell slots. If you want to go mage and you're new to the game, wizard is likely the class for you. It's very fun. It's very powerful. It's got lots of options. And thanks to the game having the ability to respec, you can fix any mistakes you make along the way. And this is true for all of the classes. Don't stress too much about your choices while you level. If you find that you've chosen poorly, you'll be able to respec as many times as you'd like. So have fun and try what Whatever sounds cool, that's literally the best part of these games. Before we continue, if you're enjoying this video, be sure to like and subscribe or leave a comment for more great content. It helps a lot. Thanks. Let's get back to it. Next, we have our abilities. Our abilities are our attributes, as they're called in other games. Our abilities are strength, dex, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. So once we've got down here, I happen to have left off on a bard earlier. So it's telling me that the bard's primary stat is charisma and we benefit from having lots of charisma. So generally speaking, it's always a good idea to have maxed out or nearly maxed out your main stat, the stat with the star next to it. That's never a bad choice. In addition to that, it's never a bad idea to put a lot of points into constitution so that you have more health. These are two things that are never a bad idea, your main stat and constitution. These are nice to have. And then depending on what you want your character to be good at, you can put some points into these other things. Strength is going to give you muscles and physical power. It's going to affect your effectiveness with melee weapons. Also determines how far you can jump and how much you can carry. Now, it is nice for one one person in the group to be good at jumping because there's going to be secret paths or there's going to be back routes that allow you to sneak up on enemies or get to places that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get to by jumping to them. And if you don't have the strength to jump far enough, you're not going to be able to take advantage of those secret routes or access those secret places. So there's just one reason out of many that, you know, having one character in the group with a bit of strength that can jump really far is nice to have. Dexterity. This is going to affect your agility, your reflexes and your balance affects your effectiveness with ranged and finesse weapons. A finesse weapon is a weapon that scales off of dex instead of strength so if your class has more dex than strength the game knows to calculate your dice rolls using your dex instead of your strength that's what finesse means ranged weapons are obvious that's your bows your crossbows your longbows short bows and it also affects your initiative and your armor class constitution is going to affect your stamina and your physical endurance it also affects your hit point maximum so that's kind of what we were talking about a moment ago where the more constitution you have generally the better because you know your character is less likely to die in battle if one or two targets is focusing them intelligence is going to help with your memory and your mental power and it's going to improve spell casting for wizards memory mental power the, you know you're going to have dice rolls in the game and 
I don't want to spoil anything, so I won't go into too much detail on when you might encounter a mental power check, but just know that, you know, there's going to be times just like all of these, there's going to be times when one of the options for that dialogue conversation is going to be like, oh, your constitution gives you this option or your intelligence gives you this option in this conversation or your wisdom gives you this option. That's basically what a lot of these mean. Charisma, force of personality, improved spellcasting for bards, paladins, sorcerers and warlocks. Again, charisma is going to open up certain dialogue options, especially if you're going to meet the checks and you might also fail some checks if you have really low charisma. It might let you choose to you know, go that route and fail horribly. Charismatic people are more likely to win people over and they get better prices at traders as a result. Now you can customize this to your heart's content. You can take points out of one, put them into another. You can say you want the one bonus point here and you want your two bonus points here. And then at the end, you might be like, well, dang, I don't know if I just ruined my character. Did I make it worse? Uh, if you're worried about it, you could just use the recommended and that's going to more or less point you in the right direction. So, you know, if it's stressing you out, you can use the recommended. Don't worry about it. The main thing to be aware of when it comes to these ability points is when there is a roll done and let's say there's a check, it's a dex check. So the dice pops up and it was a dex check. And so it would roll and it would roll a 10. And because I have 14 points in decks, it's going to be 10 plus two because every even number beyond 10 is an extra point to your dice roll when it comes to a check of that type. So I would get two extra points for a dex roll. If this was here, if it was like this on charisma, if there was a charisma roll, I would get three extra points. So if I rolled a 13, I would get to add three points to that roll and it would calculate it to be a roll of 16 on that check. Bigger is better with dice rolls. You generally want a bigger roll. So it's always good. If so if I have 10 points in wisdom and a wisdom check pops up for my character, I won't get any additional points added. Now the strength check, you'll see my strength is below 10. So what this does, every even number below 10, we subtract a point from our roll. So I have eight points. If I roll a seven, it's going to count as a six. It's going to subtract one point from that seven because I am two points below 10. So every even number above, add a point to your roll on that check. Every even number below is going to subtract a point from that check. So I would do poorly on strength checks, but I would do great on charisma checks. So that's where the importance of these values comes into play. The higher they are, the more likely you are to pass those checks because you get that extra help. And that was all of the decisions you're going to have to make for creating your character. And I promise you, if you're new to the genre, this is the hardest part of the game right here. It's making all of these choices, especially as a new player, because you're unsure of what is the right thing and what is the wrong thing and what's going to be bad for your character and what's going to be good for your character. This is the hardest part. Once you make it through this, it's smooth sailing. It's all about enjoying the game, playing the game and kind of benefiting from the choices that you made and seeing how they affect all of your interactions with all the people in the world. You know, if you have the strength to jump to that one place, or maybe you don't have the strength to jump to the one place, but you had the charisma to talk someone into letting you to go to a place. There's benefits to every single one of these, depending on what part of the game you're in and what place you're in. So if you see a place you can't get to because you chose low on one thing, there will be another place that you can because you chose high on another thing. And that's where the whole, there is no wrong choice comes into play. There's places everywhere in the game that benefit from one of these choices that you make. No matter which one you choose to master in, no matter which stats you choose to have a lot of, you're going to be rewarded for that choice at various points in the game. There is no stat where if you pump all your points into that stat, their game's never going to have opportunities for you to benefit from that, right? That's not going to happen. So now that your character has been made, the hardest part of the game is over right? It's not uncommon for people to spend hours creating their character, whether, you know, choosing their looks, choosing their stats, their backgrounds and all of that stuff. That's not uncommon. So if that's you, don't worry, that's normal. Now we're going to jump into the game and talk about how you play it, what everything on the screen is, the UI and everything like that. All right. Now, once you're in the game, your screen's going to look a little bit something like this. It's going to change who's in your party is going to change based on who you pick up and who you leave behind and who you send to camp and who you don't. And the items on your bars down here are going to change based on your class 
what you pick up, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. So let's start with everything we can see right now, because this is one of the first things that confuses a lot of people. They see all these buttons down here and they immediately go, oh my gosh, what does it all mean? It's, it's kind of overwhelming. So it's actually very, very simple. Most of it is just a heads up. I'm probably streaming this game on Twitch right now. If you want to lurk for drops, you can get some pretty cool in-game cosmetics for Baldur's Gate 3. If that's something you're keen on, if not, I totally get it. Let's talk about actions, bonus actions, spell slots, and cantrips. That's this section right above your skill bar, right above your hot bar right here. Now, every ability is either an action, a bonus action, a spell or a cantrip and spells and cantrips fall into the category of bonus actions or actions. So a jump is a bonus action. You can see it there when you hover over it, it says bonus action. And when you hover over hide, it's an action. You get one action and one bonus action per turn. Any action, any bonus action, you can do once every single turn. You're not necessarily going to do one of each of those things every turn because sometimes you won't need one of them or sometimes you won't be able to use one of those things. Maybe you're not close enough to attack, but you're, you know, you can jump because you're trying to do something like that. Some spells will be actions. This is going to help you kind of get two moves per turn on your character when you're able to. So if you're ever not sure what you can do during your turn, you can hover over your bar and see which ones are actions, which are bonus actions, and you can plan to do one of each of those things. Maybe you want to do a melee attack and then you want to fire off a heal. Spell slots are used to cast spells. Right now, this character has no spell slots remaining, which means she can't cast any of her spells. All she can cast are her cantrips because cantrips are unlimited use. You can cast a cantrip every single turn if you want in every single battle. So cantrips are really useful because they're always there. They're always available. Whereas spells, you've got limited use. Now we could go ahead and after this fight, go and set up camp and do a long rest and reset our spell slots so that we had two spells available again. And that would be a good idea if our character was all out of spells to use. Because right now she's not able to use her heals. She's not able to use her inflict wounds. All these cool spells she has, she can't use any of them anyway. But what she can use are her cantrips. So that's what she'd be doing here. She'd be doing some cantrip action and some basic attack action, things like that. So the first one is jump. Jump is just that. It's going to let you jump. And sometimes you're going to be able to jump over something, around something, onto something. You might be able to jump to a higher position. You might be able to jump over a obstacle to get to a secret path. And that's what jump is and how you might use it. Your jump is affected by your strength. So the more strength you have, the farther you jump. Also, if you're higher, you can jump farther than if you are on the ground and you do a jump like if you jump from a high place you can cover more distance and next thing you know your characters are trying to move but they're falling down one way to get out of that situation is you can jump if you jump out of the slippery substance it will prevent you from falling over and going prone which means you're going to basically miss a turn because your character's laying down and so you can just jump out of the slippery substance in this case it was grease these characters tried to walk through it they both fell down so this character jumped out of it rather than trying to walk around in it. All right, the next button on your bar is going to be hide. Hide does a lot of really cool things. Hide allows us to become stealth, which means enemies won't see us. It allows us to sneak up on enemies, which is going to allow us to do extra damage to them. It also allows us to surprise enemies. So if we attack an enemy from a stealth state and surprise them, then they miss an entire round of turns. So we get to attack them and they're surprised and then we get to attack them again. So we get two attacks before they get their first attack if we manage to surprise the enemy. So if I hide right now, now my character is hidden. There's a lot of information that you're seeing right now that's not immediately obvious. The first one is the cursor. So you see how there is a half sun lit up right there on the cursor. And if I move it to the sunlight, that's a full sun. So when you're, when it's a full sun, it's harder to pass a stealth check, right? Because you're in a well lit area. If we go into this shadow right here and we have to pass a stealth check, we can see this is kind of a shady area. Now we are slightly more likely to pass a stealth check. And if you see an empty sun, that means you are in a dark space. You can get into dark spaces by being in a cave and turning out all of the lights or, you know, shooting out the lights, you know, turning off the torches, things like that. It'll make it dark and you'll be in a dark room and your chances of passing stealth checks are going to go up a lot. So what we can also see from stealth here is we see a red area. This red area is the line of sight of the enemies nearby. We can see 
what they can see. So you've kind of got a choice to make right off the bat when it comes to hiding. You can either choose to make your whole group hide with this button over here, or you can just have the character that you're controlling hide. That's up to you. So you pick the character that you want to be hiding, and maybe you don't want to risk the other ones getting caught, right? So what you can do is you can toggle group mode. Now, this character will move without the group, and so you can try to sneak in. Now, this is a situation where this is very sunny, right? We can see when I hover there, it says it's very sunny. This is a very well-lit area. It's very unlikely I would pass a stealth check if I wandered into that. And uh, in fact, I'm almost certain I would fail. So from here, you can choose to sneak up. Right, we split the character off from the group. We can sneak behind these guys. Now, when you're stealth, you'll have the option to sneak attack enemies. This is great because this does far more damage than your normal attack. You can see here the range attack of this sneak attack is going to do 6 to 20 damage, somewhere between 6 and 20 when the dice roll. And if it's not a sneak, it's 5 to 14. So it's a considerable damage bump if we do a sneak attack. So we would do that and we could attack the enemy from here. You'll notice if we hover over the enemy, we can see what bonuses we have against this enemy. In the top of the screen, it says we have the high ground, we have a weapon enchantment, and we are hiding. So because we have the high ground, we have a better chance to aim, less likely to miss. And because we're doing a sneak attack, we're going to do more damage. So I'll shoot that person. Now everybody here is pissed. Now if we hover over the character, we see that he's temporarily hostile and he's surprised, which means he's going to miss his next turn because we attacked him from a hidden state. So we're going to get two rounds of attacks on this person before he gets one round on us. A very, very powerful advantage to start a battle off with a surprise attack. And all of that comes from taking advantage of the hide capability to put your character into stealth and then attack from there. Next, we have throw. You can throw a character or an item from the world or in your inventory. So let's say that my character on the roof here needs a heal, but she doesn't have one. I could throw a healing potion at her to heal her. She's only missing one health right now, not a big deal, but for example, we throw this up there. It's only got a 30% chance of actually hitting the right spot because as it says there, we have the low ground, which means our accuracy is decreased. When you have the high ground, your accuracy is increased. So we throw that, hey, we hit it anyway. So she is now healed. We were able to throw her a potion because it's not her turn. So if she had been at one health and she's sitting up there with one health and she's got to wait until it's her turn again to use her health potions, one way to circumvent that problem is to chuck a potion at her from a character whose turn it is. Alternatively, if you had a healer in the group, you could cast a heal on her, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's one of the advantages of throw. You can throw items, you can throw people, like it says. Maybe you have a dwarf in the group and uh, you have a really strong character in the group and you can chuck that dwarf around Go ahead and mess around with that. It's pretty funny. One thing to know about throwing is there's certain objects you can throw. Like there's weapons you can throw that will do good damage. And there's weapons you can throw that won't do good damage. So the weapon that's on screen right now, it says thrown. So when you throw that at an enemy, it will do that weapon's damage to that enemy when you throw it at them. However, if I was to simply throw my rapier at the enemy, it does not have the throwing tag on it. So when I threw it at him, it would probably just do one damage. One of the things to know about throwing things at people, like let's say there was a crate up here or a box or something, and I wanted to throw it, uh, maybe this barrel, down onto this guy. The higher up I am, the more damage that that object will deal to the person because of our height advantage. It's called impact damage. The higher you are, the more impact damage something will have when it hits an enemy when you throw it at them. So if you can get to like a really high ledge like up here and you can toss something down on this person, it's going to do a tremendous amount of damage to them as opposed to being on the same floor level as them and throwing something at them. It's going to do much less damage. And so that covers pretty much everything you'd need to know about throw. OK, so next up we have dash. We're in a battle. Things aren't going our way. There's a lot of them and there's just a few of us. They're higher level than us. It just looks really sketch. We don't think we're going to win it. We want to disengage. So one of our options is to use dash. Dash can be used to increase the distance you can travel. So if I do this, it looks like my character could go this far. Nine meters. Nine right about here. 9.1 meters, right? We could go this far. If we hit dash, we can go all the way here, 18 meters. So it doubled the distance that our character could travel. And that's exactly what Dash does. It says it doubles your movement speed. So 
you'll now be able to move all the way over here. Now, the good thing about being able to move twice as far away is, we'll show you here. Now, you may have noticed it or not, this button down here lit up, flee combat. You have to get far enough away from your enemies in order to flee the combat. Do you want to flee from combat? Yes. Now, when you flee from combat, you've still got the rest of your characters behind you. So go ahead and have them escape as well so that they can be sent to camp. The next ability on the bar is called disengage. What disengage does is it prevents the enemy from attacking you as you run away. There's this thing in the game called opportunity attacks. So this arrow that you see sticking out of him right here, that means if I run this way, he's gonna get an opportunity attack. It's a free attack that he gets outside of his turn because you're really close to him and you're doing something. You're moving away from him. So if I was this character here, and I told her to run here, right? She'd run by this guy, and as she was passing by, he would be able to slap her with his uh, with his pull arm here. And that would be an opportunity attack. Because I am this guy, it's his turn right now, I can either attack this guy, or if I'm trying to flee the situation, I can try to run away, but he's gonna get a free stab at me, but I don't want him to get a free attack on me while I run away. I can use disengage. The downside is I don't get to get as far away because I'm not going to be able to use dash because these are both an action. I get one action per turn. So I would use disengage. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow me to run. Now, see, the arrow is gone. There's no more arrow there. I can actually safely move away from him without him attacking me. Now, the next one is called dip. This is a bonus action. Dip allows you to dip your weapon into some element to modify your attack. So if we dip our weapon into fire, like this fire that's right next to us here. Now our weapon will be basically fire imbued. It will have fire attached to the attack. Now we can see our weapon has fire on it. What, what that means is we would get our normal damage of one to eight plus our three base plus a second dice roll for fire damage that would fall somewhere between one and four damage, giving us a total damage window of five to 15 damage. It's a nice way to get some extra damage on your weapon if you happen to have a source nearby. Now, another thing that you could do is you could carry candles around. If you don't want to hope for an archer to shoot a fire arrow at you and set you on fire to get your fire, you could alternatively just set a candle on the ground, you know, light that sucker up and then dip your weapon in the candle. So candles are a nice thing to carry around with you if you want a little bit of extra elemental damage on your weapons. Likewise, you can throw a poison on the ground and then dip your sword in that using the throw function. We could just throw it like right here. And then we could dip our weapon in that. We've already used our bonus action for this turn and our action because we threw and that, right? So we can't dip now, but you would be able to. The next item is shove. Shove is an incredibly powerful bonus action. This is an amazing one. Shove can be a one shot. You can push enemies off of high ledges. Like let's say we were up here and we were behind this guy right here. We could get here and push him off and he would fall down and take a lot of damage. It can be a one shot kill that you can use early on. Now the upside and the downside of shove is, well, the upside is it's one button, one kill. Really, really efficient in the right situations. The downside is if you push them into a place that you can't go, well, their loot goes down there with them and you don't get the loot. So just be kind of aware of pushing enemies into places that you might not be able to get to, especially if you are wanting that loot. So for example, we could try shoving this character right here to knock them off the ledge and have them take some damage. And that's what that looks like. Now it's not a very far fall, so it's not quite fatal, but it did do a bit of damage to them and taking two of their life away. And shove is a bonus action, so I could still follow that up with a regular attack against a different enemy if I wanted, like that. So don't underestimate shove. It's an incredibly powerful tool for defeating your enemies, but it's not just for defeating enemies. You can also use shove to push your party members out of an area of effect damage ability like let's say there's some fire on the ground but it's not their turn and they can't get out of it you could push them out of that or if something had put them to sleep you can shove them to wake them up so there's a lot of uses for shove it's a very powerful one 
definitely take advantage of that. Next up, we have improvised weapon. So you can pick up an object nearby and use it as a weapon. Sometimes the weapon you're using is just not effective against the enemy you're fighting, or sometimes you get disarmed and you don't have a weapon. And in that case, it may be useful to pick up something nearby. So in this case, we have a shovel nearby. We can pick that up and then we can use this improvised weapon against this enemy here. So we'll go ahead and do that. Bam, smacked it good. So that's always an option too. That's what improvised melee weapon does. The next action is called help. Help is what you're gonna use when a character goes down. When a character goes down, they're not actually dead. They're not out of the fight yet. They are just laying down and they are going through some dice rolls. And each time it's their turn, they're gonna roll their dice and they're either gonna pass or fail. If they succeed three times and fill up the succeed bar, they'll stand up on their own accord. If they fail three times, they will fail and they'll die like dead, dead. And uh, there's ways to get characters back after they die. We'll talk about that in a moment, but you want to try to prevent that from happening. So that's where help comes in. You can use this to help a downed character stand back up again. You can also use them to remove burning and snared and tangled and webbed, prone and sleeping, but that's gonna be a much rarer case scenario. Alternatively, instead of using help to lift someone up, you could throw a potion at them or you could use a heal on them to get them back up. Sometimes you're just not gonna be within range to give them a helping hand and those are gonna be the better solution for your problem. Now, let's say your character is close enough to help them up. You can go ahead and use the help action and run over and lift them up. What this does for that character is it stands them back up. They are pretty badly beaten up, as you can see. She's still only got one HP, so she needs to be healed ASAP or she's just gonna go down again, but she has been lifted up, and that's what help does. If a character's knocked down, help will bring them back up. Now for the rest of the abilities on the bar, these are all gonna be kind of class dependent, race dependent, things like that. You're gonna have weapons that add certain actions to your bar. You're gonna have racial actions or can trips and like everything else on this bar is going to be filled out by how you build the character whereas all this other stuff is pretty universal when you see a sword that's your melee attack and then when you see a bow that's your bow attack and if you see spells you can hover over those to each see what each of those do remember you can only use a spell so many times depending on how many spell slots you have that's how many spells you can cast and there's low level spells and low level spell slots and there's high level spells and high level spell slots. And you can use a high level spell slot to cast a low level spell to make it more effective. There's lots you can do with spells and your spell slots, but you're going to get those and add them to the bar. As you learn and unlock more spell slots, you may run out of room. You can rearrange this bar any way you see fit. Right now it's got your basic actions and your bonus actions and then it's got the spells and cantrips. This is kind of the default layout. However, you can adjust that all you want. If you come over here, there is a toggle hotbar lock. And if you click this, you can move things. You can move things around. You can put this here, you can move that there and you can move your favorite ones around to more visible areas. You can also increase the rows. As you get more stuff, you may want to do that. You may want to have more of them visible at a time so that you can find what you're looking for at a quick glance and you don't have to worry about sliding bars around. And also you can filter down here on the bottom. You can filter by common, by cleric specific, by your items that you're carrying around, by your passives, by your custom. So you could just drag anything you want in here, spells, items, everything, and just make your own complete custom bar if you would like to. I think this will be a popular option for a lot of people that just want like all their things in one place that they use, you know, kind of neatly organized. So if you're in battle and you're like, oh man, I wish I had a potion or whatever, or I need a potion or a scroll of revivify, you know, something like that you can come in here and see what items that character has available to use. Over here, we have end turn. When you go into turn-based mode, which you're gonna be in in combat, what's gonna happen is you're gonna use your points, like I'm gonna move and you can see it's using my turn, right? It's using my turn. And it tells me how much of my turn it's gonna use if I move. And it keeps getting emptier and emptier. Eventually, I'm gonna have really nothing left I could do. Or maybe I have a little bit left, but. I don't want to move my character anymore. I don't have any abilities left to use. And so I just end the turn so that my next character can have their turn or sometimes it'll be the enemy that's turn is next. Here's the character portrait of the character you're on. To the right of that, it shows you the weapons they're using. 
And when you hover over the weapon, if you press T, as with everywhere in the game, you can see the things that it's got. So piercing strike, this is an action that is unlocked because we're using this weapon. So when you find a weapon in the world, it's going to likely have an action tied to it that you can then use. So we have it right here, piercing strike. It's right here on the bar because we are wearing this weapon. This weapon is giving us this ability, this action as it's called. Whereas this bow is giving us this action, hamstring shot. So you might find another bow that also does four to nine damage, but it gives you a completely different action, maybe one that you like more. So you use that bow instead so that you have unlocked that action. Right here, you can choose like the default for this character. You can say, I want him to default to melee or I want him to default to ranged weapons so that when you just click on an enemy, he's gonna use that default weapon to attack if you don't wanna like manually choose one or the other. So that's what these are. And then here you can toggle dual wielding. If you want, you can put a weapon in the other slot and then what the game does is for dual wielding is your attack will use your action and then the offhand weapon will also attack and that will use your bonus action. So your action and your bonus action will be consumed simultaneously when dual wielding. Just something to be aware of. If you decide to do that, it's going to consume your bonus attacks. And then there is toggle light source. If you're carrying around a light source, you can toggle that on and off using that button right there. Here to the left of the portrait, you have an inventory. This is where we were a moment ago. We'll get into this in a moment. Just know that that's one way to get into it is by pressing that button or pressing I on your keyboard or whatever that hotkey is on console. Over here in the top right, you've got your map. Around the map, you've got some buttons like your journal. So here we have the journal and when you open up the journal it's going to have the quests that you basically have going at the time right now our main quest is find a cure we're looking for someone that can cure us we need to find a healer so that's what we're on a search to do now the game is not going to put like an arrow constantly pointing you in the right direction you've got to talk to people you've got to explore and when you get close you will see a quest marker on the map saying hey you know this is someone of interest here that you should talk to You'll see it on the map. You'll also see that their name is the name that's been suggested by the people you've talked to to go talk to. And there's also a map button to open up the full map. You can also press M on computer and this is going to show you the map. Next to that is ping so that you could ping an area. Maybe you're trying to get somewhere and you want to ping it or maybe you're in a group with friends and you want them to see something. You can ping the area and that way they see what you're looking at, what you're talking about. On the left, it tells you what all these symbols mean on the map, your legend. You've got locations, party members, allies, neutral, enemies, quests. Kind of like I was talking a moment ago where if you get close to a quest objective, even though the game doesn't show you on screen, it will show you on the map if you open up the map You'll see this, uh, you know, off in the corner and you're like, oh, I got close to that thing. And you can go back there and talk to that quest objective or interact with that quest objective. Plus some markers. You can put your own markers on the map oh, here for orcs, you know, like, and you can put that there if you would like to. Delete. On PC, you put it there just by left clicking. A secret. Maybe you find a secret. Waypoints. And place marker, it says, in order to place marker, left click, right? Well, that's what we did on console. You know, it's going to tell you what button you need to press there. The next thing we have over here is the combat log. It's a button tucked down in the bottom right. This will tell you what's happening so that you can kind of have a better idea of what's happening to who, you know, what state is on who and all of that stuff. If you want that information, if it's, you know, the visuals aren't enough and you want a text version of that, there you go. And finally, one really nice button here is called party view. This basically opens up all of the inventories for all of your characters. It's a really nice one to have in this menu. You can move items from one character to another, which is really useful because each character has its own carry weight. So you don't want one character carrying everything or certainly not getting encumbered because then, you know, they're going to be moving slower when they become encumbered and you don't want that. So you can distribute the items that the characters are holding, or maybe, you know, you want this character to have more potions because they're about to go through it. There's lots of reasons that you would come in here and kind of want to look at all the inventories at one time. It's a really convenient place to just kind of scatter things if that's what you're aiming to do or whatever. 
I'm approaching a town. I kind of wanted everything on one character. It was going to be nice and easy. I'm going to sell all of that stuff as soon as I step into town. You can also at the top choose what you're looking at for each character. So this is the inventory view. You can also choose to look at the spell book and you can see what actions, what spells, what cantrips they all have available to them. So you can just kind of in one place see what's what your party's working with. And then you've got your character sheet where you can see, you know, basically a recap of each character their stats, their notable features, their resistances. Now, speaking of inventories, let's go into our inventory on this character here. What are we looking at when we open up our inventory? Right here on this character, we've got the approval rating of this companion because this is not our character. This is one of our companions and it tells us how much he likes us. And the answer is he doesn't like us very much yet. We can also see what gear he has equipped. You can take the gear off, you can put the gear on, and just be aware that when you take the gear off, if you take this underwear off, you are seeing everything. And I do mean everything that this character has to offer. So just, you know, be careful if you're a content creator or a streamer, you may not want to take that off on stream. Or if you've got, you know, young kids around or what have you, you know, just uh, just be careful out there. So in here we can see the character stats, what each of those stats does. If we hover over them, what resistances they have, if any, what notable features they have. You can see the gear that they are wearing. You can see the weapons they're wearing, the instrument. This is for bards, uh, the light source. If you want to carry a torch around, if you click on a slot, it will tell you all items that you have that could go onto that slot. So if I click on this, it'll show me all the chest pieces this character has in her inventory that she could equip. So I could go ahead and put this one on if I wanted to, but it says AC bonus from dexterity limited to plus two, and I'm not proficient with medium armor. So I would not want to wear this because I'm not proficient with this type of armor. I would want to stick with my light armor. So just be careful not to put on armor that your character is not proficient with. There are going to be some downsides with that if you decide to do it. Now, the upside is your armor class is higher, so the enemy could have a lower chance to pass their rolls against you. But the downside is your rolls will also be punished. You'll be disadvantaged due to your lack of proficiency with the armor. On the right, you've got all of your inventory and there's some nice things you can do with the inventory. There's a search bar. You can search for potions and you can see all the potions that your character has on them. You can X out of that so you can see all of the things in the inventory again you can sort by value weight type maybe you're curious am i carrying some valuable things around sorry we can do this and i can see oh this thing sells for 200 down there on the bottom but we can see that this item is 200 right here we can see the weight of the item so the sort function is going to come in really handy you can sort by type maybe you want all the weapons together if you hover over this eye right here it tells you how to split stacks maybe you've got a stack of potions and you want to split it in half and share it with somebody else hold shift click and drop and it's going to say how do you want to split it so right here we have our camp supplies it tells us we have 210 we have 210 across all four characters that's not necessarily all on one character it's adding those up for us and it says we need 40 to fully rest so we could camp a few times next to that is inspiration points by playing the game you will do things on accident that give you inspiration points the game doesn't tell you what the things are that you could do to unlock these inspiration points but they're just generally things that you're doing as you're questing through the game it'll tell you oh you did something it says complete background goals to gain more inspiration so depending on what your background is the goals are going to change and you're going to get these things called inspiration points the important thing to know about inspiration points is you can only hold four at a time so when you have four inspiration points use one what do inspiration points do they allow you to re-roll let's say you fail a roll you roll the dice and the game goes up oh, you failed the roll if you have an inspiration point available it'll ask you do you want to retry this roll and you can say yes or no if it's an important roll you may want to retry it if it's not then you probably won't but all the same, you can only carry four inspiration points. So there's no point in hoarding them forever because when you earn them, they're just going to disappear to the void. So when you get to four, make sure to maybe consider using one. So you're back down to three. That way, you, the next time you accomplish a goal, it gives you another inspiration point to use at some time in the future. Next, it shows us how much gold we have on hand. There's a lot of ways to get gold. You'll find gold. You'll sell things for gold. You can steal things and then sell them to merchants. That's a really easy way to make gold. You can do quests. That'll give you gold. Lots of little ways to earn gold in this game. All very typical stuff for RPGs. Down here, you have your carry weight. It tells you 
we are at 62.8 out of 120. The way this works is this is our unencumbered state, this white portion of the bar. Eventually, we'll pick up enough stuff to go into the encumbered section, the yellow area. And what this does is reduces our move speed by one half. So we start moving a lot slower in and out of combat. And then finally, we have heavily encumbered, the red area. Now we're moving one fourth the speed that we normally do. And once you get to 120, the game just won't let you pick up stuff anymore. So it won't let you pick up so much stuff that you can't even move like some games perhaps do, but it will slow you down a lot until it says, okay, you've picked up enough. You can't pick up any more until you go get rid of some stuff. So that's where it really comes in handy to use this screen to kind of spread the loot out between all the different characters so that nobody is in the encumbered state. We also have these three tabs over here. You've got the summary, which we've already looked at. You've got skills. Skills are going to be determined by the way you made your character and the way you build it while playing the character. There's a lot of different ones in here. So you've got athletics, which says you stay fit, you perform physical stunts. It helps you shove and resist being shoved. So if you're trying to push an enemy off a ledge, having high athletics is going to make you better at pushing them. If they've got high athletics, then they are going to be more resistant to you shoving them off the ledge. Acrobatics, this is going to help you resist being shoved as well. Sleight of hand helps you pick locks and disarm traps. The next one is stealth. This is going to help you with hiding. So if you get a stealth check, the higher your stealth is, the more likely you are to pass it. Arcana, recognize magic, interact with enchanted items. So this is going to let you do certain things. My history is going to let you remember the past of the world and its people. So you might have a dialogue option where someone says, hey, you know about the one thing that happened and you might be able to say, yeah, I remember. And then it does a check to see if you remembered. And depending on how you roll, the person might be like, oh, man, you're talking out of your butt. You don't remember that at all. Then maybe they like you a little bit less or something. Investigation will help you analyze clues, solve mysteries, nature, recognize plants and animals, hug trees. And so this will be another one. All of these will be ones where you see in dialogue options while you're playing. Religion, recognize details, understand holy right, animal handling, influence animals, pet all of the dogs. Insight, read people and situations, detect lies. So sometimes someone might be lying to you and there'll be a check that happens mid conversation and the game will be like, oh, you failed the check. And you're like, what? And it was your character failing to recognize that they just lied to you. So you don't get the dialogue options. Sometimes you pass and you'll get a new dialogue option that says, I don't know, man. It sounds like you're full of it. Medicine, recognize symptoms, diagnose disease. Perception, observe your environment, spot hidden details. Perception is a really nice one to have on at least one character because uh, there's a lot of times you'll end up in a, tr in a room with booby traps. When you get close to a trap, there will be a perception check. You'll see a dice roll on screen. It'll say you passed. And then all of a sudden you'll be able to see this trap that was about to kill your entire party. It might be a landmine or something like that. So perception is a nice one to have. Also, if you have one character with really high perception, it's going to help kind of navigating those sketchy situations. Survival, stay alive in the wilds, track prey, deception, lie and cheat, manipulate the truth. As with all of these, it's just going to make you better at doing that, you know, in conversations. Pass those checks. Intimidation, be a bully, threaten and induce fear. Sometimes an option will be, you better let us pass or else we'll kill you. That's an intimidation option. It'll say intimidation next to it. And if you have high intimidation, you are more likely to succeed in that threat. So you're more likely to intimidate them successfully. Performance, entertain audiences, command the stage. Sounds like a bard thing. You're right, it is. And persuasion, turn on the charm. Like many of these, this is a nice one to have. You'll get dialogue options sometimes that are dependent on your ability to persuade people, to talk them off the ledge or to be like, hey, we're all here for the same reason. You know, like, let's let's get along. Let's team up for a moment here. And that's where that kind of stuff comes in hand. So as I said at the beginning of the video, there isn't really a wrong way to build your character. You're always going to, no matter what you lean into, you're always going to be finding situations in the game that take advantage of the stats that you leaned into. And you'll always likewise find situations that take advantage of the stats that you didn't lean into and it you get an option to intimidate but you have no intimidation abilities and so you fail that check so that's what all of these are and you'll run into them constantly when you're in dialogue options when you're walking through the world and your character's intuition and your character's perception are either going to notice that there's a trap set ahead or they're going to notice that there's an ambush ahead or 
they won't. Next, we have our detailed view. This is where you can see how much hit points you have, what your armor class is, what your class is, what your race is, what your background is, your initiative, movement speed, dark vision range, right? All of your all of your stats, the nitty gritty of your character in case you wanted to see it. Another thing that you'll notice in your inventory is your alchemy pouch, your camp supply sack, and your keychain. So these are nice little basically inventories within your inventory and you can open these up and see what you have inside. And in here in the alchemy pouch, we have our alchemy ingredients that we've picked up along the way. So you'll see shrub that you can interact with, things like that. And there you go, you grab it and it ends up in here nice and neat. Same thing with your camp supply pack. You can open that and you can see all your camp supplies. So you've got supply packs, 40 per camp, and then you've got food and you can see there, it shows you the camp supply value that it has. If the camp supply value of your food adds up to 40, you can use that instead of your other camping supplies to set up a camp. And also we have a keychain open and we can see the keys that we found along the way. Finally, you'll notice that this character has leveled up and they've got an up arrow right here under level up. And then over here above each character, it says that they've leveled up. So you can click that arrow or you can click this. Either one will work. It'll take you to this character's level up screen. Once you're here, you have some important options to decide on here. You can either choose to accept the level up of your class that you chose. Right now, I am a rogue and I could level my rogue from one to two. And this is what I would get for that. It would be nice. I would get some extra health. I would get some new actions. But alternatively, instead of just accepting this at face value, we can choose to add a class. This is called multi-classing. You can earn up to 12 levels total for your character. Now, your class levels are different. So your character can level up to 12, but your classes, if you have more than one, will have a sum of 12 levels. So if you do add a class and let's say you took a druid as your second class and you got your druid to three, that would mean that your rogue that you started with could only go up to nine. It's a total of 12 levels. So you've got character level and then you've got class level and your character is your character, how many levels this character has earned. Some things are locked behind character levels, like feats. These are some extra passives that you can unlock along the way, and they're quite powerful. You'll get those at character level for eight and 12, whereas your classes will all have unlocks that happen at certain class levels. When you hit level two, you might have your class unlock a new spell. So if we click on the add class option here, you can see here that we would be able to add any one of the 12 classes except for the one that we already are. We can't multi-class a rogue when we're already a rogue. We'd have to pick anything else. And if we do that, then we get to choose all of the things that come with having a level one of that class, including, you know, your cantrips, your spells, an instrument if you are a bard and your abilities. There isn't a right or wrong answer here. If you want to multi-class, go for it. It can be quite powerful to multi-class. The pros and the cons of multi-classing are this. If you level a rogue up to 12, then you're going to be able to unlock those things that are tucked behind rogue level 10, rogue level 12. Those high level unlocks that the rogue has, you'll be able to get. If you level a subclass, or a multi-class up to five, then your rogue's only gonna be able to unlock the things up to level seven because you can only have a total of 12 levels. So it's a little give and a little take there. Now, a lot of classes have very powerful unlocks early on in their development, which is why multi-classing does work if you want to do it. You won't get to get some of those high level unlocks, but you'll get an early level one for a new class that can be quite powerful. For example, rogues can get a sneak attack at level two, fighters can get action surge at level two, and barbarians can get rage at level one. These are all very powerful tools in your kit, and they're unlocked super early in these classes. So multi-class if you want to, just be aware of the fact that you're gonna be dividing your 12 levels between two different classes. That's gonna come with some pros as well as some cons. And if you don't wanna deal with the hassle of managing multiple classes, don't sweat it. You're totally fine to put all your levels into one class. So that's what we'll do for now. We'll just put a second level into the row here. Now let's quickly talk about kind of exploring the world and all the things you can do within it. So when you're out in the world and you see a corpse or a box or anything that you can loot, you can hover over things to try to find them and look for them like that by moving your mouse around and just kind of looking for your objects that you could loot. Or you can hold alt. Alt is going to reveal everything that you can interact with on the ground. 
It's going to reveal plants that you could interact with, a javelin that you could pick up, corpses you could loot, all kinds of stuff. This is incredibly helpful, especially after a big battle like this. Or, you know, if you're just walking around and you're heading down the path and you want to make sure that you don't miss any lootable objects along the way. Oh, look, there we go. Those would have been really easy to miss if you weren't holding alt. So hold alt and it's going to make it so much easier to grab the things around you that you want to loot. Another thing that you can do that you've seen me do throughout this beginner's guide is move your camera independently of your characters. On PC, it works just like a WASD. So that's how you move your camera and then you use Q and E to turn it. Now you can go in and change those controls to whatever you want. Those are just the default. You can press O on the keyboard to get a top down view. This is great for kind of scouting ahead, seeing enemies that are up on high places because when you don't have that POV, your camera is quite a bit lower and it's, you know, you can keep going, but it's not quite the same vantage point. So this is kind of more of a strategic view when you're trying to really scope out the situation. Oh, there's a guy there, for instance, right? Which you wouldn't have seen with the camera down here. Now let's talk about your camp. After a battle like that, when all your characters are injured, they're out of spells and they need a night's rest, you can go back to a waypoint that is nearby, or you can open your inventory and use your camping supplies. Once you're in your camp, there's a few important things you can do. You can talk with other camp members to progress your relationship with them. You can swap party members in and out. Maybe you don't want a Sterian in anymore. Maybe you want to bring somebody else in. So you'd sit him down and bring somebody else into the party. You can store items you don't want to sell, but you also don't want to carry into the chests. Lots of good things that you can do here. Be sure to come to camp often. It's the place where you're going to progress your story with your companions and your relationship with them. Occasionally, you'll see an exclamation point over their head, indicating that they have a quest that you can do with them and for them. But one thing to note about doing a companion quest is if you're going to do a companion quest for Asterian, make sure you put Asterian into your party and he heads out with you. If you leave him in camp, you're not going to be able to progress his quest. Keep an eye out for hidden characters throughout the game that you can invite back to your camp that won't necessarily be in your party, but they will be able to hang out in your camp and have pretty cool conversations with them. That's all I'm going to say about that for right now, just to make sure we avoid any spoilers. These are, this is the fire and the bags. So if we click on that, you have enough camp supplies to restore all hit points and spell slots if you long rest. And let's say yes. And now you can see this companion here has a quest that we can pick up from him. We can go ahead and talk to the other companions in camp as well if we want to get to know them a little bit better. So once you've talked to everybody in camp, then you can go ahead and tell it that you want to go to bed. Someone in camp still wishes to speak with you. Yeah, we're going to go to bed anyway. So this is where we'll be able to choose which camp supplies we want to use. We can go ahead and hit auto select and it's going to take this one right here, which is conveniently a pack of 40 camp supplies. So because you have a finite number of camp supplies and you have to find more in order to camp more, you're not going to want to camp too excessively, but you do want to come back and do your short rest. Remember, you can do short rest twice for every long rest. Now there's two types of rests. You've got the short rests and the long rests. You can do two short rests for every long rest you do. The short rest is going to be good for resetting certain abilities like for instance this one here piercing strike i can use this once every time i short rest so if i use this ability i have to short rest to be able to use it again short resting will also refill your hp long resting or in other words changing to the next day is going to be good for well starting the next day ending the current day refilling your health resetting all of your spells so that you can cast them again right because your spells have a finite number of uses like for instance the cleric has spell slots and these are going to recharge once per long rest so once you've used your spell charges you're going to have to long rest in order to be able to cast more spells and then you click on your bags to leave the camp when you're ready to leave and you're back out in the open world now what happens if one of your characters dies dies right it goes down you don't help them up, you don't heal them, you don't throw a potion at them, and they die. Well, you've got a few options in that case. One is save scum, as it's called. You can basically reload your last save. This is a type of game that definitely has a lot of advantages with save scumming or with 
you know, frequently saving or quick saving so that you can reload when something doesn't go your way. Now there's two schools of thought when it comes to save scumming. You know, some people are going to say that you should never abuse the save feature. If you roll the dice and a conversation doesn't go your way, you should live with the consequences. You should live with your actions and let the dice tell the story. Other people will say, screw that. I don't want to miss out on a great opportunity or a cool item just because the dice didn't roll my way and to be honest there's no right answer here at the end of the day you're playing a game so whichever way is going to be more fun for you is the right way for you to play the game if you want to load a past save when something goes wrong when a character dies go for it that's totally fine and if you want to play by the rules and you want to let the dice tell the story that's great also in the end you can have your cake and eat it too because you can do multiple playthroughs of this game it's a game that definitely lends itself to playing through it more than once and so you can do it one way the first game and you can do it the other way the second game let the dice fall where they may the first time through and on that second time make sure you get all the outcomes that you want or vice versa now alternatively if a character dies save scum isn't your only option you can use a scroll of revivify this will let you revive a downed player you can talk to an npc in camp that will revive dead companions and some of your companions might also have a skill that will resurrect fallen allies so there's three options within the game and then the fourth option being you know load an old save the scrolls can be quite expensive so try to avoid using them if you can and to just quickly go over fast travel, we've got waypoints like this one right here. This is what they look like. You'll find them all over the place. You go up and you interact with them. That will unlock it. And after that, you'll be able to go from one to the next. The waypoints all over the map will look like this. You've got that gold symbol. You can go from one to the next anytime you want to. And you can just hover over them over here and it will take you to those waypoints. Every waypoint you've found will show up in the list here. And you can use them anytime for free. It's that simple. I'll click on that one there. For an example, I'll click on this one here and it's going to take me to that location now. So feel free to use those as often as you want. Next up, let's go over party composition. Now, what I'm about to say is useful, but it's by no means required. So whatever you do, don't let yourself be pigeonholed into doing a certain thing. This game thrives on players ability to try limitless combinations. So revel in that if that's what you'd like to do. If you're nervous about creating a horrible party and you'd like some suggestions, let's dive into that now. The first one is try to have a healer in your group. Shadowheart is a healer. She's a cleric and she's nice to have around or you can grab any cleric you could play the cleric if you'd like to and you could be the healer for your group but it is nice to have a character that heals they're also great for picking up down party members bards clerics and druids all have great heals that you can take advantage of making for great support characters if you're looking for one the next one that's really useful in these types of games are tanks the advantages of having a tank are fairly obvious they can stand between your softer squishier supports and your glass cannons and the enemy if you have a tank who does a decent job of controlling dangerous enemies it can save you a lot of pain literally fighters barbarians and paladins make great frontliners if you're looking for one another great thing to have around is a area of effect class something that can throw aoe spells or spells that hit multiple targets at once having a party member in the group that can hit more than one target at a time is incredibly helpful when you face off against groups of enemies the wizard is my favorite candidate for this spot thanks to to the plethora of options it can obtain in a single playthrough. But the sorcerer and the druid are also great options for this. If enemies aren't grouped up, try bringing them to a choke point so that you can utilize your AOE abilities to your advantage. Finally, you need a hard hitter, a big single target class. These are great for eliminating dangerous enemies. There's always going to be one enemy on the field that is more dangerous than the rest, and it's going to be very important to take them out ASAP. If you don't, they're going to be taking your party members down one at a time. Having a party member built to single out specific enemies and end them with haste is incredibly useful. Melee or ranged will work, but if the character is proficient with bows, they'll have an easier time picking off dangerous targets in all locations as well as being able to climb up to higher ground to take advantage of height advantages present in the game for this single target killer you can use any class there's a lot of loadouts on various classes that will do tons of damage so this is one for you to kind of pick and choose at will Rogues and Hunters are great with bows if you want to use one of them. Astarian is already a rogue, so if you want to have more variety in your group, maybe you would choose to go Hunter. 
in order to bring a Starion along as a rogue. If you wanted that, maybe you don't want a Starion in the group and you want to have somebody else in the group and you could be the rogue in the group. It's really up to you. It is really nice to have a rogue in the group, I will say, because it's great for being able to sneak into all kinds of places and pick locks and they have a lot of utility. So I highly recommend having a rogue somewhere in the group. If not you, then hey, a Starion's great for that. And before we move on to the next topic, it's worth mentioning that the fighter actually makes a great bow user as well. I almost forgot to mention that one. Now, if you open up your map, you can see a few different tabs at the top. You've got your map here, which we've already gone over. You've got quests that are currently ongoing as well as completed. You've also got inspiration. Inspiration is what we talked about earlier. If you achieve background goals, then when a character performs an action that's true to their background, they gain experience points and receive inspiration. Inspiration may be spent to reroll an ability check. So. We touched on this briefly earlier, but you know, just to reiterate your inspiration, you can only have four of this at a time. So if you have more than four, you're going to get the XP that comes along with it, but you're not going to get the inspiration points and the inspiration point that you would have got will go to waste. So whenever you have four inspiration points, be sure to spend it when you fail an ability check. Make sure you always have space open to earn that next inspiration point. Otherwise, they're just going to go to waste. And just to remind you, you can see how many inspiration points you have right here in your inventory right there at the top. I've got zero right now. If I were to load a slightly later save than this one I would have one so you will run into these you will get them fairly frequently so don't be too shy about using them but you know don't waste them either my character is currently an urchin which says after surviving a poor and bleak childhood you know how to make the most out of very little using your street smarts bolsters your spirit for the journey ahead then you've got dialogue in case you want to review dialogue when you get into a dialogue conversation with somebody there's going to be a lot of options for your character you're going to be able to choose how, you know how your relationship with whoever you're interacting proceeds or whether you're just going to straight up kill them and it's going to say for example here i can say i'm not running and their aim's not good enough to save you right he's threatening to shoot me with his archers I could also say, spare them the trouble and just let me pass. I'll be gone in no time. You know, persuasion. You know, we're going to try to be nice about this. And then we could also say, stand down now. And if you're wondering which one has the best chance of succeeding, one of the things you can do is hover over the word intimidation. And here it says we get no additional points to our roll. It's just a D20 roll. There's no advantage or disadvantage given to us here. If we hover over persuasion, there's a plus two persuasion from our proficiency. So this is looking like a good option right now, depending on how much we want to succeed. And if we come down over to wisdom, we get plus one to our roll from our wisdom. So persuasion is looking like, you know, the best chance of succeeding, depending on what you want to accomplish here. You know, if you're looking for a conversation, if you're just looking to get through it, there's a lot of things that will affect which one you choose. Do you want them to stand down so you can talk or do you want to just pass through? Are you looking to just survive the situation? This can all affect what you choose and the likelihood of succeeding is sometimes shown to you over here on the left. Then you've got tutorials. This is a nice little section here where you can open this up. And if you're not sure about something, you can click on it here and get a nice little description. Camp is a place of respite, recuperation and reflection. You can talk to your companions about your adventures so far and choose who will join you in future escapades. You can also store items and take long rests here. Visitors may come and go from your camp throughout your adventure, be they friends or foes. And then end of day. You can end your day of adventuring and head to camp. If you have sufficient camp supplies, long resting at a camp by interacting with a campfire or bed rolls will restore all hit points and resources. So if your health is running low and your resources are depleted, it may be time to rest. Visiting camp at night also allows you to talk with companions or followers you've gathered and reflect on your relationships and adventures. Okay, the next thing we'll talk about are merchants and how you sell and buy from merchants, how that whole system works, how to refresh their inventories in case you buy the things you want and they're all out, or in case they don't have any more gold to buy the things you wanna to sell to them. So right here is an example of a merchant. There's nothing over his head that says merchant or makes it particularly obvious. I just talked to him and one of the dialogue options was what are you selling? And we can come in here and now we can see the merchant menu. In this menu, we can go ahead and send items over, click on them, right? This is gonna put them in there. At the top, it's telling me how much gold all of the items I'm trying to sell are worth to this merchant. In effect, how much gold he's going to give me for all of these items. 
So if I load it up like this right now, the menu might be a little bit confusing. Do you hit the scale? Do you hit barter? What do you do? How does this work? Well, what you're going to do now is you're going to hit the scale. It's going to balance the two sides. So now once you have both sides balanced, right? If you hit the barter button, it's going to complete the transaction. The gold that's here is going to go into your inventory and the weapons here are going to go into his inventory and everybody's going to be happy. So we can go and do that. Now he's only got 221 gold left. So we could keep selling things to him until he ran out of gold. Or we could buy items from him, like these gloves here. These are nice blue gloves. The first blue item that this character's seen in the game right now, and we're seeing it on a vendor. So we could buy those with our gold and any other things that we needed. So let's say we bought all of the red dye from him and we wanted to restock his inventory so that we could buy more red dye. Or let's say we sold so many items to him that he ran out of gold. How do we reset his inventory? So one way to reset a merchant's inventory in case you need them to have more gold or more items is to go and rest. Do a long rest. So we'll go and we'll do that. You know, while you're here doing this, you should probably talk to all your NPCs, definitely anyone with an exclamation point over their head, pick up companion quests, all that stuff. Do everything that you need to do here. Stow some items. Take advantage of the long rest. If you're going to take one, it is using 40 of your camp supplies after all. All right. Now that your long rest is over, talk to the NPC, ask to see his wares. And there you go. He's got a completely new inventory, a new amount of gold, and you can sell more stuff to him. You can buy new things from him. And it looks like he even still has the items that you sold to him last time in case you wanted to change your mind about some of those sales you made. All right, the next thing we'll quickly touch on are the different types of quests. You've got main quests, side quests, and companion quests. Right now, we have the main quest, which is find the cure. This is the very first thing that happens in the game, so hopefully that's not too much of a spoiler for you. And then we have companion quests based on the companions that you've picked up and where you're at with your relationship with them. And then there's side quests. Right now, I don't have any side quests, but one way to find side quests is to talk to various NPCs throughout the game, unlock quests through them, or of course, you know, maybe read something like a disintegrating journal. And by reading journals like this, there's a chance that it might unlock a quest. And lo and behold, this one did. Journal updated, explore the ruins. So if I go into my quests, here we go. Now we have a new side quest for us to complete. So make sure you interact with everything in the game. Make sure you interact with journals. Make sure you interact with books. Make sure you interact with anything that you can. You're never going to regret it. Well, I shouldn't say that you're never going to regret it because some things are booby trapped. So just be aware of that. But for the most part, you know, be a curious person, it's going to pay off. And like I mentioned in the camp section of this video, you will be able to progress your companion quests by going to camp, talking to your companions and pulling them out. And then make sure you put them in your group whenever you go to complete one of their quests. If they're just sitting in camp while you're out doing their quest, the quest may not progress like you're hoping it will. And as you might have guessed, your approval rating from your companions is definitely going to be improved by doing their quests and helping them out. So that's going to be a great way to progress your relationship with your companions. It's worth noting that objects aren't the only thing that you can interact with in the game. You know, certain classes are going to be able to talk to animals or interact with the dead. You can have conversations with the dead. So don't count anything out. Be very curious again. Be very curious. Now let's quickly go over the dice rolls, how they work and how they interact with like your attacks, for instance, what it means. So if we look at our attack here, it says 1d6 plus 1. What does that mean? What that means is the attack is always going to do a base value of 1 plus somewhere between 1 and 6. You're rolling a six sided dice to find out what you're going to add to the number 1. So the plus value at the end, that's your baseline damage. You're never going to do less than that plus whatever the dice rolls. So in this case, it's 1 plus 1d6. So if we rolled the dice and got a 4, we would get 4 plus 1 damage for a total of 5 damage. That's how this works. If you have some kind of an imbuement or some kind of an element on the weapon, like you dip it in acid or you dip it in fire, you're going to have a second roll after the first. So the first roll would have rolled 1 plus 4 because you rolled a 4. And then the second roll will be a dice roll of somewhere between, let's say, 1 and 4, depending on the situation, the element and everything that goes into that. So you're going to roll a four sided dice and you're gonna get a value somewhere between one and four. So you would get your five that you rolled on the first roll, plus let's say you rolled a three on the second, now you're gonna do a total of eight damage. Five bludgeoning in this case, plus 
free fire damage. Now, depending on the type of mob that you're attacking, that may do more or less damage to the enemy, like skeletons, for instance, take extra damage from bludgeoning. Whenever you roll a dice and let's say the enemy's armor class is 13 and you roll your dice, you have to hit a 13 or above to land your attack. If you hit 12 or below, you will miss. If you hit 13 or above, it'll land. Tie goes to the person rolling their dice. In some situations, you're going to have an advantage or you're going to have a disadvantage. And what this means is if you have an advantage, you're going to be rolling two dice and then the game will take your better roll. So if one dice rolls a 10 and one rolls a 15, the game will give you the 15 if it's an advantaged attack or an advantaged roll. If you're disadvantaged, the game will take the lower of the two rolls. So if you roll the 10 and a 15 from a disadvantaged state, it would take the 10 and apply that to the situation. Okay, now let's go ahead and go over some quick menu options you should be aware of. The first one is going to be session. This is where you can come in here and you can invite friends to your group if you want them to play as one of the characters in your party temporarily, or if you want to have them play as one of the characters permanently throughout your whole play session. Under difficulty, this is where you can come and at any time you can change the difficulty of the game. If it's too easy, you can change it up to tactician or up to balanced if you had started on explorer, or if it's too hard, you can change it down to balanced or down to explorer if you started on tactician for some crazy reason. I don't recommend starting on Tactician. This is incredibly difficult. So unless you're a veteran of the game or a veteran of the you know, genre, be very careful about starting with Tactician. All the same, even if you do start on the wrong one, you can change it at any time with no repercussions. So don't stress this decision too much. Next, we've got the options menu. In here, there's some really cool options. You can choose your visibility so that your friends don't know that you're still playing this game at 4 a.m. being a degenerate. You can have the game autosave. I highly recommend setting autosaves to on, and you can change the number of maximum auto saves and maximum quick saves that the game has. I highly recommend learning what your quick save key is and using it before you go into situations where everything could go horribly wrong. Unless you're the type of person that just wants to let the dice fall where they may, I respect that, go for it. But if you're someone that's going to be really upset if you choose the wrong dialogue option and you end up killing someone that you really liked or something like that, you know, if it's a tense situation, maybe hit that quick save before you go into the ruins where it looks like there's an ambush ahead, right? That way, if it goes horribly, no skin off your back, you can reload the last save and do it better the second time. You can also choose Choose to show or not show genitals and nudity, you know, something that's useful if you've got young kids or maybe you're a content creator and you may want to turn that stuff off. You can also have karmic dice on or off by default. It's on. This makes it so that you don't get too many bad rolls or too many good rolls in a row. Right. So it's just that way you're not in the fight and it's just miss, 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 miss. It tries to keep it mostly random, but it will also try to tip the scales in your favor a little bit. If you're having really bad luck with dice rolls too many times in a row for it to be kind of fair. Next, we've got another one that's kind of cool down here. They've got uh, Twitch integration. I have connected it. I'm going to be letting my chat make all the major decisions for my party while I play through. So I fully expect it to be pure chaos while I'm playing through the game. I expect almost nobody important to survive and some of my characters will probably end up mating with just about anything that walks. So if that sounds like a good time to you, definitely swing by my stream over at twitch.tv slash lucky ghost. Under the keybind section, again kind of peruse this and take note of the buttons and what they do just so you're kind of aware of it we already talked about toggling the tactical camera with O, moving the camera around with wasd you're able to show item labels like things you can interact with by holding left alt you can skip videos although i highly discourage you from skipping any videos or any conversations while you're playing this game if you're tempted to skip dialogue boxes in this game you're probably playing the wrong game this is a game where you know it's all about the story and the experience and your interactions with characters i know a lot of games have really bad stories or they have really bad dialogue and so in those games it's very common for us to just want to skip them this is not one of those games there's a lot of effort and a lot of detail in the story and the story story is what you're here for. So marinate in it, live within it and read that dialogue and then make the most appropriate decisions based on what's happening. You'll notice that you can also toggle alchemy. You can press space to end your turn. Lots of hotkeys in here. We don't need to talk about every single one. By the default, I guess it's worth noting that quick save is F5, quick load is F8. So just make sure you don't hit the wrong one and accidentally load back to your last save when you meant to save where you're at currently. 
under video, you know, this is all your video settings. These are going to depend on your computer, how performance is, if the game is stuttering, if the FPS is low, if it's not running really well, you know, consider changing your resolution down to your monitor's resolution or consider changing, you know, the quality down from like high and ultra to whatever your computer can handle. Just kind of play with it until the game's running really smooth. Under audio, nothing particular that I think you need to be aware of. It's mostly your typical audio settings. Under interface, you've got choice you can choose north facing minimap. That's what I prefer. I like my minimap to be kind of always north facing and then I can move my character around within that. It's easier for me to keep track of where I'm trying to go. And that's on by default. I believe you can tell it to show the speaker. You can tell it to show text background. Lots of good options in here if you are having a hard time kind of following things or seeing things or, you know, just generally keeping up with what's going on, which kind of brings you into the next section accessibility, which is especially for all of that stuff. It's got more genital options here in case you missed them in the other area. It's got subtitles and things like that. Just kind of peruse through here at your own leisure. I think the most important ones to kind of glance at are going to be gameplay keybinds. These are the two where uh, you can save yourself a lot of time and hassle by knowing how to do certain things in this game. Although, you know, pretty much everything you want to do, there's a button for it on screen somewhere. And that's why there's so many buttons. Good buttons to kind of be aware of is like hitting F1 takes you to your main character. Hitting F2 will take you to the second character. F3 takes you to that character. Right now I'm controlling him. F4, the fourth party member, right? Kind of goes down the list if you want to switch between those kind of at will really quickly without having to kind of come over here and click on them manually. Just saves you a little bit of time. There's no right or wrong way to do it, however. So that concludes the video. If you made it this far, you're an absolute legend. This one took a lot of time and effort. So leave a comment down below if you made it to the end. Thank you so much for watching. Also, quick shout out to my YouTube members. Thanks for supporting the channel. If you want to become a member of this channel, click the join button below to have your name displayed at the end of these videos and for access to a private Discord channel, behind the scenes footage, and more. If you want to hang out with me while I play games live, I'm over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash lucky ghost. I'll have some drops active for Baldur's Gate 3 while I'm there if you want to take advantage of that. If you're not sure what to do next, maybe drop a like or a sub and check out one of these videos popping up on screen right now.